layperson, I'd like to, to know what is what is the what is that difference in the stratification? Or what what's the effect of it? I think of it as physical layering of the water. It doesn't mix. But, but when it goes in anoxic, well, you, you want to explain when it goes in anoxic. Yeah. You know it when it's happening, when it's stable, if you start getting the anoxic development, it's, it's oxygen consumption from the sediments lowers it. And uh, that's probably the easiest indicator that it's occurring. But under, under anoxic conditions, it sets up a redox potential. So basically, the sediments release a lot more phosphorus under anoxic conditions as compared to when it's well oxygenated. So you get, as I was saying, a really nutrient rich layer down at the, the bottom. So what you're getting out of the lake uh, is a very nutrient rich layer of water. That's right. It's, <coughs> it's the worst water in the lake. Okay. And we don't, in Pigeon Lake, we would not encounter a very nutrient rich layer of water. That's really what you're saying. That's right. Yeah. We've, we've done sampling too at, you know, at discrete depths in, in Pigeon Lake and concentrations are the same in the surface yeah. as they are. Yeah. yeah. It sounds like your wind fetch, the wind is the factor. It's, it's a relatively shallow lake. The deepest is about nine, nine and a half meters. The average depth is about six meters. And, and it's, it's, it's a big lake, so yeah, it has a huge fetch on it. So. And the mean depth of Pine Lake is, I think, 5.3. So it's actually shallower, but it's the unusual. It's, it's a long, skinny lake. With a and it's pretty trough. steep hills around yeah. the outside. Yeah. You, you don't, don't get the wave, wave action that the engine does, so relatively it's less turbulent. Yeah. It's just the luck of the job. I think it's a glacial meltwater. Yeah. Yeah. Further to Chris's point, can you tell us some of the other assumptions, I guess, with this working properly? I mean, strongly stratified lake, uh, anoxic, anoxia in the sediments that results in the phosphorus releasing, so significant internal loading. What were some of the other things, I guess, that walked you through to get to this particular solution? Well, the things I mentioned, we, we, you have to look at downstream impacts or some use for the withdrawal water. But just the ability to get rid of that water, period. Yeah, for starters, we, you know, we wouldn't be able to do that at that stage in either. Well, some people will have done something similar to this, but they treated the water and then put it back in the water. Yeah. What works there is just the fact that you have stratification. Yeah. That pine lake. It's, not, it's not actually all that stable. Uh, in uh, 1992, there was, a, there was a, a really unusual frost in August and the lake overturned. So it's, it's just on the edge, just stable enough. Would you get those conditions occurring under winter ice cover in Pigeon Lake, possibly? Uh, well, I'll ponder so I can tell you that the limited under ice sampling that we have done, that we did in 2000, it was early 2007, like late February 2007, because of the 2006 being we're concerned with potential kill sure not from so and so but we found it's actually quite well option in the waterfall. Uh, having said that as, as I pointed out we really do not have a lot of under ice data for a pigeon lake so I can't see for certain that that's the case in all the time. You have to have some evidence of strong internal release during the winter. And I've never seen a lot of evidence of that. I know uh, We've done a lot of work on under ice in Washington. No, I agree. The, usually under ice, you don't have uh, the metabolic rate that drive that consumes the oxygen to create the anoxia, and therefore you don't have the also the redox push that you have yeah. because the metabolism is slower. And, and that, and that. You do have periodic under ice conditions where you develop anoxia and you have a fish kill, but that's because of an influx of organics and because of Deposition of a bloom or some other factor. So usually it's uh, yeah. the cold temperature keeps that oxygen up there. Yeah, the, the other big factor at Pine Lake is just having enough water that you can operate a system like this. I think I planned on uh, being unable to operate it two or three years out of ten, and I think we've done a little better than that. So what I'm hearing about the water budget at Pigeon Lake is you just don't have enough water. So there's a, by the way, this is Pine Lake Coral. 
It's a trapper team that forms in the bottom of the lake. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a body. It looks like a coral reef. It's the only freshwater coral in Alberta? I think it occurs so in another lake. Yeah, it's happened to a lot of groundwater in the lake. The market there for divers, I'm sure. Okay, that's what we're really concerned about. 
how is that internal loading coming? In shallow systems, internal loading, and we'll show you a couple graphs, can still be significant even though they're mixing all the time. You still get it. But never forget the watershed. You have to turn off the fossil. Okay. The watershed is the ultimate source of the, of, of the phosphorus and nitrogen. And so you have to work to make sure you get the watershed. The trouble is, you have to do, if you just do external, depending on the flushing rate of the system, on the hydraulics of the system, that legacy phosphorus that's been brought into the system and causing it to overcome its resiliency, it's going to keep cycling and cycling for years. Lake Okeechobee, in Florida, we did a model where we determined that after we shut off all the external nutrients to Lake Okeechobee, that's a 360,000 kilometer lake fairly big, that it would take anywhere from 40 to 800 years before we saw an improvement in size of bacteria. Okay? So it's a real thing. Uh, this is just, again, driving from my point. Phosphorus. Phosphorus was related to a lot of production in terms of side effects. And a lot of us talk about that, but just making sure that's kind of Okay, this, this last column here is what to look at, at different systems. Looking the first, first is, is the percent of, of um, external load on an annual basis, and this, the second number is the percent of load, annual load that's coming in. Let me rephrase that, I'm sorry. That was a previous slide. I saw this, this slide from a different pre presentation to EPA that I gave when I gave a one. But this is the percent internal load. The first number is the percent internal load occurring in the summer months during the growth season. The second number is its annual load based on the annual load. So what you see is a significant amount of loading, particularly Grand Lake St. Mary's, where only 25% of the total load is internal. It's a shallow, wind-driven, fetch-driven lake, fairly large, smaller than pigeon. <laughs> well, almost it's 5,000 hectares. Um, but only 25% comes in on an annual basis. But that almost exclusively drives the summer cyanobacteria. Okay. Something to keep, you know, just that's been reiterated and, and something to keep in mind based on the talks and the literature that, that I was sent to look at. So keep in mind is, is, is key. It, whoops. Whoop, 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 whoop. Wrong button. Long residence time. That means your recovery of the system is going to take a long time. And it also means what gets to the lake stays in the lake. You know, when, you, when you consider that phosphorus in a shallow wind-driven lake with a large fetch can recycle 20 to 40 times before it is moved either through flushing in this lake very rarely or lost to the deeper sediments. Okay. So you, you put in a kilogram of phosphorus you're going to raise 10,000 kilograms of algae 40 times, potentially. So don't ever forget the watershed. But understand, for the current uses, for the next few years uses, lifetime, you got to work in the lake. you got to do both. Okay, another thing to keep in mind is, is, is um, the water pH is fairly high. We'll get into some examples of internal cycling and other uh, inactivation where pH is really important. Well, what is the pH in the setting? What's the organic pH contact? You've got some blooms going on, so we've got some organics in there. Historically, the sediments were probably deprived of organics, and they're building up over time. So what is the mineralization rate that occurs there in the oxygen demand in that sediment? It's not so much that we're taking all the oxygen out of the water column. It's how the sediments are reacting. You've got two, two things to think about. Iron, you have a fair amount of iron in your sediment, and your iron to phosphorus ratio is very high. It's well above 15%. But if your redox goes down and your DO goes down, you're going to release that phosphorus. If you capture phosphorus in cyanobacteria, they settle to the bottom of the lake, okay? 
they mineralize, they decay. That process is the release of phosphorus. That occurs when the temperature's up, when the metabolism's going up, and summertime. When it comes to light, it takes it up. So it's something to think about. Okay, um, you also, relative to the pH of the water, pH of the sediments, I don't know what the pH of the sediments is. Do we know what the pH of the sediments is on the surface? Relative to 7.8? I think it was mentioned that. What's that? 7.8, 6.7. Well, yeah, because the water is about 8.4. Yeah, exactly. 8.4. Eight, 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 so, it's, so the, the question here is, it's below A4. So below A4, you start to see the calcium-bound phosphorus becoming bioavailable. The other point is, even though we have an excess of iron, once the iron comes out of the sediment with the phosphorus and it's mixed in a water column, at the high pHs around A4 or above, it may not readily combine and precipitate out that phosphorus and take it back down to the center until the algae get cold. Okay, so that's another factor to consider. Okay, now I'm gonna go into some techniques just that was just kind of by way of an intro of something to keep the fact in your mind. Now we'll just go through several different approaches. Some of them have already been talked about, so I'll make them quick. And some of them aren't necessarily as useful for Pigeon Lake, but we're going to talk about them just briefly so that they're out on the table, okay? So dredging. Uh, first of all, my first dredging project was 1978, okay? So I've had whole lake dredging, partial dredging, all sorts of things. The thing with dredging is, is it directly removes your phosphorus reservoir. It takes that legacy phosphorus out. You have to dispose of it, but it's there. It can restore the sediments. So, I mean, you, because you're taking out organics too. So you, you can change that redox potential of your sediments because you're taking the, the oxygen demand. The key to dredging, how long is it gonna last, is what your watershed's doing. Mm -hmm. Your watershed's bringing in sediment. If it's bringing in nutrients that grow algae that contribute to the sediment, your dredging may not be that effective. The other key, is to think about, um, yeah. the other key is, is, is to think in terms of <clears throat> how long it's gonna last is how effective your dredging program is and where you dredge. You don't have to dredge everything. If that's not the rich phosphorus pool, you're after the rich phosphorus pool. So as mentioned earlier, I think Chris, you talked about the depth of phosphorus is critical. If you don't, a lot of dredging failures have been because you haven't dredged deep enough. If you've got phosphorus down here that's 90% of what it is here, you go down to here and stop, well, you're still releasing phosphorus. <coughs> Whenever you remove sediment, remember, there's an equilibrium that has to be reestablished between the overlying water and the newly exposed sediment. That can take two to 10 years. So a lot of people, when they build a new pond, or a golf course dredges a pond, they have two years where it's, ooh, it's real sketchy, and then all of a sudden it comes up. It's that new equilibrium. Yeah. So you have to think of that. The other, I mentioned the area. Target your areas. You could have hot spots. I mentioned Lake Klamath because it's a big shallow lake. It has areas where the sediments are hot relative to phosphorus. So you wouldn't necessarily dredge the whole lake, but you would go after those hot spots. Yeah, dredging those hot spots. Yes. So with an existing ecosystem, there could be catastrophic effects in the short term, say, in the short term. Yeah. Um, short term. Yeah. All the fish might die. You could, say, uh, you could expose a, a layer of organic, a readily de uh, degradable organics that could cause a huge uh, oxygen demand. Yeah. Like you can determine that by testing or by taking a set of uh, doing, doing the dredge, yeah. the coring of the sediment. Yes. Right. There must be confinement to the dredging so that uh, you don't uh, increase locally the DOP. Oh, if you, it depends on your dredge. There's several different type of ways of dredging. If you use a hydraulic dredge, that's, you don't have to worry about it. You have to it all out. So there's ways, but I don't want to make it sound like dredging is a disaster. It is the ultimate in-lake restoration because you're getting rid of the phosphorus. It's out. 
you're getting rid of the organic source. It's out. If you do two things, you dredge deep enough and you dredge evenly enough within the area, you've got to do it. Most dredging does not have the application control to dredge like you mow your lawn. What do you do when you mow your lawn? You overlap your passes, right? Pass here, pass here. Most dredging is in the blind. They don't have the cameras, they don't have the depth outfit. So they dredge here, they dredge here. What happens? You get something like this. The dredge goes, the sediment goes, whoop. You have the same characteristic sediment throughout the loop. Okay? So I'm coming down on it, but it's a good technique. I'm just letting you know. And the size of the lake you're talking about, you have to really poke a lot of holes in the bottom of that lake to discover is there a hot spot or not, because dredging is expensive. Very expensive. That's those are my two things. Okay. Questions? Yeah. So uh, Jade said that we have phosphate rich soils here of glaciation. Would the lake sediments be considerably higher than the, the, the underlying soils? The phosphorus? In time ago. What has happened to your watershed? Uh, there was in one of the reports that was sent out, there was a graphic that demonstrated the increase in in hogs and, and cattle production and, and within the watershed, that alone is going to add to the phosphorus that wasn't there historically when the 70s were going down. So you, you can magnify that with watershed activities. Is there another one? So just, uh, we kind of already kind of go through, through these, so uh, I don't want to belabor it. I do want to bring up a point. One of my first NOMS conferences in 92 in Vancouver. Um, the unevenness of dredging and, and also not the depth profile. I made the point that if you want to avoid that equilibrium period, the two to 10 year period, you inactivate the sediments. A slight, a lower dose, inactivating of that sediment allows you to avoid the problem that you might do by not having an adequate dredge. In the last 15 years in the States, the cost of sediment disposal and the cost of the sediment removal has taken sediment in a back burner except for very site-specific areas because it costs so much more than other alternatives. But it's still the for sure long-term approach if you have the money. Your system's big. <laughs> so only very site specific area, if at all. <clears throat> hey, we just had something about like this. <laughs> um, my first study uh, and, and was involved with hypomatic aeration in the early 80s. Um, so, Al's pretty much covered these things. Um, If you do not have an adequate depth or water budget to play with, uh, and maybe a, a, a narrow volume in the hypolimnetic area, you may have to inject water to replace the water so you don't have the lowering of the water level and so you can maintain stratification. So that's just another thing to think about. So you got to have a source of water that's clean, low in phosphorus, because you don't want to put that back down. Um, so that's that's something to think about. Uh, you're also, when you're injecting water, you're adding phosphorus, so what's our balance given the fact that you have no flushing? What you put in stays in. The other point, and I'll make this point, downstream impacts of that water is real. So make sure you understand what the characteristics of the water are and, and, and <coughs> take corrective action because you don't want to kill a whole bunch of sand swimming up there in the full group that you've dumped the water. You're not having that problem for pigeon nor do you have the shape that makes hypomimetic withdrawal a viable option. But dilution. Hey, dilution is the solution to dilution. I learned that in the 60s. No. 
it will work if you have a very low phosphorus su water supply and you are pushing enough water through that system that you effectively increase its flushing rate. In other words, you change its hydraulic. Then it will Moses we'll like this an example of where you have low, very low inflow water that they use for dilution. It's running about three to seven percent and it's effectively flushing the system and it's it's helped it's replaced that. Aeration circulation. First I'm going to frame it. What's the average wind speed? systems are, are, are designed to do. Expose water to the surface, to the atmosphere, to get re-aerated. Or you can supply oxygen or air to it and help enhance that. But basically, you're already there. So, and, and so, uh, but, now, let's just frame it as an approach because so many people talk about it. Why don't we do this? You can have an answer. There's basically, you know, mixing depths is important because there's two things with circulation or three things you're trying to do with circulation. One is you're trying to increase the depth so that you increase light limitation on the algae so that they stop, they not photosynthesize. Two, you can do that and inhibit and disrupt their photosynthetic cycle by the speed in which you mix. So their, their gas vacuums, the buoyancy that, that we've already talked about this morning, is overcome. They get all turned around when they turn on their photosynthetic cycle and stuff, and so they're not as efficient. Or you aerate the system and you have iron in the sediment in the water column above 15 to 1, and it precips, precipitates out the phosphorus. That's the other thing we're trying to do. But, remember, we're at the borderline pH, so this may not be as effective as we want. Plus, once it hits the sediments, we're not aerating the sediments, so the iron phosphorus is a bit. Um, if you don't meet these things, you can actually get more algae in your circle because now you're exposing the algae and the inner depths to more light. Even though you really don't have a true established large hydrogen, you know, I had to throw this in here because back in the old days, <laughs> Gary knows about this, I designed the world's largest hydrogen that I could ever So, uh, you know, 90, 90 meters long. <laughs> so, 15 meters in, the, in one pipe with an inner pipe of, of three meters. So, uh, pushed a lot of water through that. I, I took, this is an 1,100 acre lake, 50% of the water volumes in the hypermonia. We, we, we exchanged that hypermonetic volume through the areas of the fluids. You don't have the situation. The key here is just like aeration. Not the foster cell. So you have to have iron to be able to do it. This lake worked for a while to burn down the oxygen and it did have iron, but because of external loading, it now doesn't have the iron. And so it's not keeping it for 20 years. So now we're going to just neutral the back of the I spend most of my time talking about neutral activation because that's the most successful in lake technique today. It's been done. Multiple continents over the years. It's very successful if it is done right. It can lead to a lot of problems if it is done wrong. So it's not panacea, but it is a interim step towards management of your lake in the lake. If your watershed is not fixed, 
you're going to have it, and the inactivation treatment will have to be repeated because you're bringing more nutrients in and it will go over time. So with any inlet activity that we've talked about and going forward, you're not talking about a one-stop shopping. Dredging is the only, quote, 50 plus years, if you do it right, one shop stop. Everything else is on. Okay. Again, get back. Yes, you gotta treat the watershed, and yes, it takes a long time. Sometimes you never see the lake recover. So that's why you gotta do inlay, but you have to do both. Okay. So basically there's four different types of strategies that I like to talk about in terms of inactivation, regardless of what you use to inactivate the fossil. It's interception. That's to capture the phosphorus. Alice is talking about <laughs> of, of an injection, but to capture the phosphorus before it gets there. Intercept it, remove it from the inflow of streams, or collect the rough surface runoff if, if you can, and treat it with we'll get into that compound to capture the phosphorus. The second is water column stri stripping. This is the what we call a flocking, to remove it out of the water column. Just knock it down, get it to the center. Okay? It's a lower dose, but it has to be repeated every time the water, the phosphorus comes up. Okay? Or a maintenance dose. You have a watershed that's constantly putting things in, and you periodically have to do it. Now, smaller systems, this is very appropriate. Large systems, you just have to get into the cost benefit as well. For like smaller, smaller systems like on golf course ponds or parks, a maintenance treatment where you may do it two to three times a year is your most cost-effective way of doing things. But your system in Pigeon Lake is too big. You're not going to do a maintenance system. You can't do it. The last and the most complete is inactivation. <coughs> Strip the water column of the phosphorus. Add an excess amount of material to combine with the phosphorus in the sediment and biologically inactivated. You have removed it from the <coughs> biological pool. That's what inactivation is. Okay. Whether it's combined with, <laughs> whether you're using aluminum, iron, calcium, or lanthanum. Okay. All of those compounds have an affinity for phosphorus. In the natural world, before we walk across the planet, those four compound, com compounds chemically combined and held phosphorus. Okay? Now, we have some new compounds, polymers, that are used in sewage treatment, stormwater treatment, industrial treatment, to remove phosphorus and other things. They're not advised to be used in, in late treatments. Why? They strip the water column, they, they grab the phosphorus, they strip it down. <clears throat> which nobody talked about. We talked about all What are polymers? They're organics. They break down. When they break down, what happens? They release phosphorus comes out. Okay. When they break down, what do they consume? Oxygen. Okay. Increase the adverse conditions you want. Okay. So polymers are okay if you're doing an interception and removing the sludge and the phosphorus before it gets still. That's one of the chemicals you can use. But in lake, it's these four. Okay? Now, they all have different characteristics that you have to pay attention to as to selecting which one. Uh, I went through and did a little uh, grading. Even though calcium's not primary. Uh, so, Basically, doing the different kind of strategies, aluminum works out to be, for most lakes and most situations, the best on a scale from five to one. Okay? Um, using a combination, there's some unknowns. We haven't done that a lot, so we don't know. But as long as aluminum is it's around here in a normal pH range of sediment that we find, mm, that's one that you want to combine with. I have a question mark here with lanthanum, just strictly because the literature, scientific literature independently hasn't come out as to what is the historic reaction of lanthanum when it's added to the sediment. 
we know what happens with aluminum, for instance, your aluminum will form a ratio ultimately in every link that's been treated with aluminum to 11 to 1, aluminum to phosphorus. That's what it equals out to. Once you get below 11 to 1, it no longer is holding the phosphorus. Iron, I've already mentioned the 15 to 1 magic ratio. You have to have that in order to, to be effective. And calcium it is it's a little different. Platinum has a similar stoichiometric relationship when it combines to aluminum, when it combines with phosphorus in terms of a pure solution. The question is we don't know how it reacts under long-term acidic conditions that exist in the most organic sediments. So that's my question. Gary mentioned for calcium and hydro, what's the, the, I guess, the most effective pH range for aluminum? Aluminum? <laughs> okay. <laughs> get to, don't yeah. remind me. Okay. I'll do all of them. How's that? Sure. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, when you're talking about inactivation factors and, and long term longevity, adding iron to a sediment that is eutrophic because it has organics means you have low redox probably. Itself unless you oxygenate the sediment somehow. Uh, so aluminum, lanthanum, and calcium are relatively insensitive to that redox. So they're stable. They will hold the phosphorus under an anaerobic conditions in the sediment. Capturing. Now, what happens when you do an inactivation treatment? You add an excess of the material in the water column and in the sediment. So I mentioned, remember I mentioned 11 to 1 is the ultimate ratio of aluminum to phosphorus that you get in the sediment. So you want to add somewhere between 20 to 100 to 1. Okay? Because you've got competition. There's other things that are going, that aluminum is going to combine with to get to 11 to 1. Okay? So you've got to add an excess. Now, with that excess in the sediment, you've got this aluminum out here the phosphorus being generated either coming out of the iron or mineralized out of the organic, and it's floating to go up, and there's this subtraction. And if you've got enough aluminum, the space there is going to attract it, and it will combine and precipitate, okay, or chemically combine. The reason I have a question here on lanthanum is because we have to study that in the system, get more information on it, because lanthanum is attached the way it's applied today is attached to a clay. So its physical spacing and its attractive distance is a critical unknown that we don't know how it behaves around a, a large organic molecule that's released. Okay. So that's just, you know, we don't know yet. And again, iron's poor because when you're mineralizing, you're in that city condition, uh, redox conditions, so it doesn't work. And if you're around organics, you're probably below a pH of 8.4. So here's so